Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We would now like to invite our CEO, uh, Dr. Lim Dree, to start with his opening remarks. Dree, please. Good day, everyone. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion on maritime innovation, connecting tech and talent for decarbonization, uh, which is being held in partnership with the Royal Danish Embassy in Singapore. My name is Joey, and I'm the CEO of SG Innovate. I'm honored to be opening today's event alongside Her Excellency Sandra Jensen Landi, Ambassador of Denmark to Singapore. Ambassador Landy uh, took up her appointment late August last year, relatively fresh to our country. So I take this opportunity to once again, very warmly welcome her to the shores of Singapore. SG Innovate uh, is a government owned early stage deep tech venture capital firm and ecosystem developer. Our raison d'etre is to make concrete the potential of deep science and deep technologies for social and economic impact. And we do this by bringing people together, by fostering collaborations, by raising awareness, by developing talent, and ultimately by investing in deep tech startups. We work closely with our partners, such as the Royal Danish Embassy, with whom we have had a long, close and productive relationship to organize events like today's because we see such conversations as important precursors to eventual action. Bringing together players and stakeholders across the ecosystem to share their understanding, aspirations, plans, and best practices ultimately advances innovation. Today's topic, maritime innovation, connecting tech and talent for decarbonization, is one of immense interest to Singapore, Denmark, and the world at large. Uh, climate change, I, I, you know, I, I, this obvious to everyone, is one of the most critical issues confronting humanity today. Uh, Europe, Scandinavia, Denmark have been leaders in responding to this threat with concrete concerted action. Singapore is also building up its own head of steam. Just yesterday, the Singapore government announced sweeping measures based on goals that were set out in the Singapore Green Plan 2030, which itself was launched last month. The global shipping industry, which handles over 80% of world trade, also produces more than 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions each year. Reducing this massive source of emissions is going to be critical in the fight against climate change. To this end, the International Maritime Organization has set the target to reduce the shipping industry's greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2050 and the carbon intensity of emissions by 40% by 2030, going up to 70% by 2050 against 2008 levels. In ramping up our green efforts in the maritime space, Singapore is also exploring low carbon alternatives. One notable initiative is the joint collaboration by our Maritime and Port Authority, the Port of Singapore Authority, and various other players to pioneer ways in utilizing hydrogen to power our shipping industry. And I believe our speaker, Kenneth, from the Maritime and Port Authority will touch on that later. Likewise, Denmark, already a front runner in the green transition, is also targeting carbon neutrality for its shipping industry by 2050, beginning with the commercial operation of its first seafaring zero emission vessel by 2030. As SG Innovate continues our vital partnership with the Royal Danish Embassy in Singapore, we hope that our collaborations will drive greater flow of insights and knowledge in these fields to propel Singapore and Denmark towards our building our zero carbon future together. I'm very excited to hear from the panelists in a while on how Singapore and Denmark can further collaborate to realize the green transition to our shipping, logistics, and supply chain industries through sustainable technologies and talent development. On behalf of SG Innovate, I would like to thank all of our speakers for taking time off their very busy schedules to share their insights with us today. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Magnus and the team at the Royal Danish Embassy in Singapore for this event and for the many great collaborations over the years. We look forward to stronger partnerships to come. Now, before we commence the panel, I would now like to invite the ambassador to say a few words. Ambassador Landy, please. I'm unmuted. Ambassador, are you unmuted? <laughs> Thank you so much, Joey. 
Yeah, uh, and thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I haven't been here very long, but I already know that this is one of our key partnerships that, uh, that uh, we're definitely very happy with our collaboration here from the embassy. And I think this event today is already a clear example why uh, there are so many who have tuned in and uh, it's very much you're doing at SG Innovate. So thank you for, for that and kudos to you and your team. You are all hardworking and good partners for us. And thank you for outlining so nicely why we are here today. Um, because I, I couldn't agree more. So, so uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Lim. And thank you uh, for everyone for tuning in. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, welcome. It's one of these pleasures with virtual uh, webinars that, uh, that we can connect across the globe. Uh, I'm also happy to see so many tuning in in spite of the webinar fatigue that I think we're all feeling here <laughs> almost a year into to COVID. Um, so it just shows how interesting this discussion is. And I'm definitely looking forward to he hearing what our exciting panelists have to say on this important agenda. As you mentioned before we've done uh, from the embassy, we have done uh, um, events with SG Innovate before and also around uh, decarbonization. The first time was in, in April 2019 and, and since then the agenda has only grown in significance and strength. Um, many consider this the great maritime challenge of this decade uh, and I, I definitely would say that, that for Denmark, if we see it like that. We see decarbonization, green transition uh, as the main uh, agendas that we are uh, trying to, to push forward in, in almost every discussion we're having. Uh, last year, the Danish government made a commitment to reduce the Danish uh, greenhouse gas emission with 70% by 2030 uh, from our 1990 levels and become climate neutral before 2050. We are not yet sure how to get, a, get there, so it's, it's very ambitious, uh, but we are committed uh, to it. And, and shipping is one of our key sectors. The maritime sector is a very important sector for, for, for a country like Denmark. Um, so this is one of these areas that we're looking at. How can, we, how can we do better and how can we do more? We had already said that we would have the first uh, ocean going zero emission vessel in commercial operation by 2030, but uh, already uh, Mask, one of our big actors had said uh, a couple of weeks ago that they want to have it on, on the sea by 2023. So they sort of raised the bar. Uh, and I, I really appreciate this uh, private pool. Uh, we have to have the private sector up, out front. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And that keeps us as governments on our toes and, and and we are right there, both Singapore and Denmark are committed uh, to doing our best. So in Denmark, we have established um, 13 climate partnerships with businesses across several sectors uh, to help re reach these ambitious uh, emission goals. And uh, one of these climate partnerships is with the maritime uh, industry, and they presented their recommendations on how to reach the climate goals in March last year. And these recommendations have already fed into a number of tangible initiatives. The most prominent is the plan to establish two energy islands. Uh, you might have seen uh, some, something about that in the press recently. It will be connected to offshore windmills and have a capacity of, of five gigawatt. Um, we are very proud of this initiative. We, in all humbleness, expect it to be a, a new global standard. Uh, for energy production, and we, we do expect it to, to uh, help us uh, reach our, our ambitious goals. Um, it could uh, eventually meet the electricity needs of 10 million European households and produce climate-friendly fuels for shipping and other industries in this uh, power to x facility that we, we're talking about. All uh, very ambitious, it's moonshot, there are a lot of things we still don't know how to get there, but we are as I said before, committed to it. The industry itself has also presented three very impressive initiatives um, besides these recommendations to the government. One is a hydrogen and e-fuel production facility at industrial scale that will be placed in Greater Copenhagen. Another is Europe's largest power to X facility on the Danish West Coast, which will aim at converting power from these offshore wind turbines to green ammonia and Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners is leading with a number of Danish market leaders uh, within agriculture, shipping, they are all behind this. It's, a, it's also a brand new initiative. 
And then there is also the establishment of the Mask McKinney Muller Sensor for Zero Carbon uh, Shipping that will also help accelerate the development of new green technologies and fuels. And we have uh, today Bo Siepsinomusen with us. Uh, he's at that uh, exact center. And also Maria Skipper Swen, who's here from, from Denmark. And they are, will represent the, she's, she's representing the political interest of the Danish ship owners, if you will, uh, at home and abroad. Um, Maria is the executive director for security environment and maritime researchers at Danish Shipping. So in other way, uh, words, we have a strong lineup. I'm happy to, to have my, my fellow nationals here and I'm looking forward to hearing what they will say as I'm looking forward to hearing what the rest of the panel will say on this important agenda. And I will not take up any more of your time because they have much more interesting and detailed things to say than I have. So I know there's an abundance of, of great ideas here and innovations uh, ready to unfold. So I will just uh, leave the word, pass the word uh, to Tarun and I hope you will take us uh, through a very interesting panel discussion. Thank you all for, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Ambassador uh, Sandra. I think uh, you, you said it quite well that this is the great maritime challenge of our lifetimes, right? Uh, despite the fact uh, we most countries and cities were in lockdown last year, the ships kept going. The global supply chains kept going, right? And increasingly, the customers of the industries are realizing the importance that shipping plays for global trade for industries to continue operating, for the global consumers to have access to goods that they always desired. I think shipping plays a crucial role, but it also has been a challenging year for many, but has also thrown a new model for collaboration. The moment we talk about vaccine development, I think there is a new model in front of the world, the way R&D institutes, multilaterals, governments, policy makers, private organization came together to actually iron out a potential model that can actually be adopted to the next greatest challenge that humanity is actually facing, which is climate change. While we were going through uh, the last uh, year or so and continue to navigate the challenge of COVID, there are new ways of working that's also thrown up, right? We've all been adapted to remote ways of working. And there's also increasingly work streams opening up. What really holds uh, the new future model of work for us, right? What are the new ways of working that uh, the global workforce can start tapping into the ecosystem, right? And increasingly, we start hearing the term global nomads becoming a standard uh, sort of nomenclature. So with that in view, today we have lined up a great panel where essentially we'll be talking about maritime innovation uh, from a decarbonization perspective, but focusing essentially on some of the key ingredients on enablers, technology, talent, policy intervention, and of course, capital, right? So without taking any further time here, let me introduce, uh, let me get the panel online here and request each of the panelists to introduce themselves, but also provide a context of uh, their organizational priorities into this particular topic with a focus on decarbonization. So why don't I start with Maria here first? Could you kindly introduce yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, um, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is uh, Maria Skipper. I represent Danish Shipping, uh, which is a representative of the Danish Shipping Companies. Denmark, uh, we consider ourselves a leading shipping nation um, together with Singapore. Singapore is uh, usually our great partner. Um, and we work closely together, both in terms of uh, uh, flag registration uh, but also at the political level at the IMO, and that's really the core of uh, our function. Um, we are part of the Danish delegation to IMO. We sit in as advisors, and of course we follow and push and do everything we can uh, in order to, to push the regulation in the right direction. And as Tarun rightly said, yes, this has been a very challenging year, but shipping is really has not stopped in, in terms of uh, not only just functioning, although we have huge challenges with the crew change, but in terms of decarbonization, we clearly sense that there is a strong will to continue uh, on this path. And even though negotiations at IMO has been very difficult due to, uh, due to well, this setup of negotiations uh, as we cannot meet face to face, they do continue and we do sense a, a willingness to, to actually collaborate and to agree on, on regulation. Thank you. Thanks for that, Maria. I think it's only fair that I call upon uh, Kenneth Lau uh, to introduce himself. Thank you, uh, Tyrun, and uh, good afternoon, Your Excellencies and everyone, ladies and gentlemen. 
On behalf of Maritime Singapore, let me just welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth, Kenneth Lim. Uh, I'm the Assistant Chief Executive in, at the Port of Authority of Singapore. Uh, Maritime Singapore and uh, NPA, we call it Maritime Port Authority of Singapore, is an IMO council member. And uh, Maritime Singapore is a place uh, where we really want to work with uh, all partners, R&D and our overseas, uh, you know, like Danish shipping, uh, different embassies. We want to work because Singapore is a place in which we have uh, the International Maritime Center. We have uh, almost 5,000 establishment of maritime companies in Singapore. Singapore is uh, the top uh, transshipment hub. Uh, so last year, we do uh, at about 36.9 million uh, TUs of uh, container throughputs. So this is a place in which we have uh, connectivity to 600 ports over 120 countries. So you can see the context in which if there are so many ships, uh, as I look up out of my window, there is uh, 1,000 ships out in the anchorage, uh, you know, waiting, uh, bunkering. Um, and uh, Singapore is actually also a top bunkering hub. Uh, we do about 49.8 million metric tons of bunker last year. Uh, and of course, uh, being the fifth uh, ship registry in the world, we, uh, we need to make sure that we have quality flags, our vessels are good. And therefore, you see in this, uh, all this combination, we need to really work uh, very closely with our partners, both locally and overseas, to overcome some of the challenges that we face today and tomorrow, uh, and decarbonization is definitely one of the top topics that we need to work together. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kenneth, and definitely looking for your inputs as we progress through the panel. Uh, Sanjay, would you want to go next? Thanks, Tarun. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, especially to Ambassador Sandra. And once again, welcome to the shores of Singapore uh, and fellow panelists and everyone listening in. I think there's 93 of us on, online at the moment. Um, Singapore Maritime Institute, abbreviated to SMI, uh, is a partner with MPA. We, are, we work very closely with MPA to further the transformation efforts uh, at Maritime Singapore uh, and hopefully in Maritime in general through innovation, research and development. We, we fund the research uh, through the local universities, polytechnics and research institutes. And uh, we also provide the uh, roadmap of tran uh, innovative transformation uh, that the maritime sector is going through. We, we plan, uh, uh, we desire very hard to work with industry to make sure that the research is contextualized and will have traction and impact to that transformation. So, and I think, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of in, uh, invention and uh, we need people to help achieve those goals. So talent uh, is a very important part of uh, innovation equation. Thank you, Tarun. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, Definitely now calling upon uh, Bo here. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank you very much for inviting me into this forum. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Mask McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. And we have been established in order to help accelerate uh, the transition of shipping towards decarbonization. So uh, we believe that a lot of good activities are ongoing already. So we see our task very much uh, as helping to facilitate the process, connect dots, connect partners across the globe. Uh, in order to, first of all, get uh, the big picture in place, get an overview of the opportunities and start to create confidence that it is actually possible to decarbonize shipping and how this is possible. Uh, and then, of course, by having that overview and that confidence, we can also zoom in on the necessary developments, the necessary investments, uh, and the necessary uh, next steps uh, in a very concrete manner. 
And so I do believe that what we're talking about today, which is about global connect connectivity, enabling global talent to help us working on this challenge, uh, working in new ways is actually very, very timely and highly relevant for this huge challenge that we have in front of us. We are working uh, in a very open manner and, and as we now get going through this year, we're going to open up our overviews. We're going to invite openly for collaboration across the globe. And I hope that actually by all the learnings of uh, this nasty COVID situation, that we have actually also learned uh, that the world is much smaller and that it's much easier to connect across the globe to share experiences and, and work together. So very happy to be here on this panel today and looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you. Thanks for that, Bo. Uh, so perhaps let me come back to you and you know, thanks for laying the foundation to all the panelists uh, for setting the scene here. One of the first questions that comes to my mind is of course, you know, it is the big challenge for the shipping industry when we think about decarbonization, but essentially it is a climate change uh, and a net zero ambition of the customers of the industry. And of course, the, the demands of the society that's driving this change, right? Uh, when we think about decarbonization within the context uh, of the maritime industry, and this is specifically for you, Bo, is it enough to only focus our efforts on fuels of the future, whether it's hydrogen or ammonia? Or this is actually a unique opportunity for the maritime industry today to go back to the drawing board, to look at the value chains differently, to look at the business models differently, to even look at how we are adopting technology in the industry. So what do you think about uh, this particular opportunity for the industry? I really think that it goes way beyond just uh, inventing a new fuel. It goes way beyond that. We're looking at transformation of an entire energy system here, enabling shipping uh, to be part of that decarbonization, which the entire world uh, needs to, to get onto. Uh, so it's something that goes, I mean, you could wish that it was only about replacing uh, the fuels uh, in the tanks, in the ports, and then nobody would notice and it was all decarbonized. But the thing is that it is, it is a matter of finding out how can we make available uh, the new clean fuel types. And as you were alluding to earlier with the talk about the scale of matters in Singapore, uh, the scale in the globe is that we have 300 million tons of fuel that needs to be replaced. You know, so that would be more than 200,000 of the largest wind turbines in this world that would need to be put in place to generate the fuel for this industry. It's not something that happens overnight or easily. It's something that uh, just if you take shipping alone is going to affect countries, energy systems, infrastructure, so it's a huge challenge and it really ties into much more uh, development than just for shipping. So on the one hand, it's really about understanding how can shipping get access to clean fuels of the future at the same time as the rest of the world wants that. And we know that uh, renewable energy is going to be a scarce resource in the future. So we need to think very carefully about how that decarbonization is done uh, to make sense on a societal scale. So that's one thing. And then secondly, when you start to look at how this is going to apply uh, to shipping, we are going to see big changes, I am sure, because these new uh, energy sources are going to be much more expensive than the fossil fuel base. The today's infrastructure is optimized around access to fossil fuel, which is very inexpensive. So now by turning to new energy sources that are much more, that are more scarce, that are more uh, expensive, I'm confident we will also see new ways of actually driving the shipping industry. So we will find ways that will lead to more optimized uh, global shipping systems with higher utilization, with higher uh, energy efficiency, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, I think we have very, very exciting um, decades ahead of us here, not only on the energy and technology side, but also on the regulatory side, on the financial side, on the business side, as was mentioned, and how do we enable actually the customers to buy decarbonized products, 
because that uh, is a strongly growing trend and demand from the market. So there's just a lot of things that need to be developed now over the next decade in order to really uh, be ready for scaling uh, up uh, by the end of this decade. And if you look at the timelines involved, uh, this is what is going to be needed. So, so I think uh, we have to keep in mind the timeline here also that we are in a situation of great urgency uh, and great scale uh, and great complexity. So back to the point from the very introduction here, this is a challenge that requires great engagement also from talent across the globe on different levels. So no, we're, we're looking at a transformation, not just a replacement of a, of a single fuel. Thank you. Thanks for that, Bo. I think that's a perfect segue to my next question to Sanjay, right? As Bo mentioned and alluded to that, of course, this is a complex problem to solve and we don't have to solve it in isolation in the shipping industry. Potentially we are, rather we are part of a bigger jigsaw uh, when we think about looking for newer solution creating new solutions. And one of the avenues of creating new solutions is R&D. And the way I think about R&D is essentially talent. Right? And increasingly the way you know, policies have been defined across the world, there was almost a challenge in moving talent from one location to the other. And there were enough times that we've seen that efforts were duplicated in terms of an R&D effort. So what is your take on R&D tech talent and how can you know, uh, countries come together to actually have an efficient deployment of resources? Uh, thanks, Tarun, for that question. Uh, yes, I, I wish I had a simple magic bullet answer that uh, will solve the whole thing, but it is a complex uh, question because there's the, both the domestic and the international requirements that we need to think about. I think it, domestically in Singapore, uh, we're a small community. Uh, and uh, uh, we are starved of ta talent. We have talent, but the question is the critical mass of talent that we need to actually shift the needle on innovation and R&D. And uh, uh, obviously the pandemic has not helped with the mobility of talent, but also uh, mobility of talent has become a political issue, not only in Singapore, but the rest of the world in terms of uh, accepting people from other countries. But if we put on our humanity hat and we say that we really need to innovate to decarbonize and save the world, then we need to have a different perspective about mobility of talent. In the past, I would imagine that uh, you needed talent to be on site to get stuff done. But I think uh, the pandemic has shown and uh, we always knew in our heart that technology is a great has a great platform to uh, facilitate collaboration, even if uh, over time and space, right? So you could collaborate with the universities in uh, Denmark, for example, without having to be physically there. What it actually does take is the, uh, the will first to collaborate and the ingenuity of designing the solutions that, that can tap on talents across the two borders that would uh, create more than the sum of each uh, uh, of the individual parts, right? And I think this is where the, the courage and the leadership and political will must come together uh, because sometimes we get too caught up with uh, ownership of IPs and the potential commercialization that we forget that we are trying to solve a bigger solution uh, problem here. And sometimes we need to allow our talents to collaborate over space and time by creating a platform. And if necessary, allow them to move through space and time to come on two shores and go to other shores to be more effective. So I think mobility of talent uh, is a very important part of uh, the equation when we are solving talent gaps. Because as much as we want to grow domestic talents, there is, a, there is a time constraint. So we need to kind of be imaginative how we can achieve both to build our local talents and to achieve our innovation outcomes. Thanks for that, Sanjay. Let me just sort of shift gears here and uh, take up uh, your inputs on talent mobility, but I'm gonna bring in uh, an aspect of uh, regulation and policy intervention, but from a talent mobility between industries. 
So when we are looking at, as an example, at AI solutions for shipping, at times you've seen in different parts of the world where talent is not from the maritime industry looking to adopt or move into the maritime industry, but they're taking a step back because of the perception that the maritime industry is heavily regulated or they're too small to move the needle. So maybe I can get Kenneth here to share their views from a policy and regulatory perspective on how regulators you know, from within the shipping industry attract and create those regulatory sandboxes where we are then able to attract talent not from the industry to solve some of the biggest problems of the maritime industry. Thank you, Tarun. Uh, and maybe I'll just uh, uh, also add on uh, that uh, in our journey in transformation for the maritime, we have really see that uh, we need innovators, we need uh, experts and uh, even startup R&D community from, uh, from outside the maritime industry. So I'll just give you an example. I think in our shipping industry last year and even as of now, uh, crew change has always been a big challenge. Um, and so when, when vessels reaches uh, Singapore, one of the uh, challenge was how do doctors go on board the ships? How do surveyors go on board the ships? And, uh, and for that, uh, last year, what we did was to really open up and call for collaboration. And, uh, you know, we see uh, startup and companies from the healthcare industry coming forward and say, well, we can provide telemedicine, you know, and the doctors can actually just examine the seafarers and give them the fit for travel. And so this is already a classic example of how uh, a non-marine time startup coming into marine time with their expertise in another domain and complement and augment the maritime industry. And so I think uh, where we come from is that we want to make sure as a regulator that whatever solutions out there in the maritime, in our port, is must be technically ready, it must be safe so that we don't cause too much uh, public risk. Uh, as well, it must also make sure that the economy makes sense. But we also understand at the same time that if you don't take risk, then innovation won't happen. So the keyword that you mentioned is to have a regulatory sandbox. So for smart vessels, autonomous vessels, for instance, Singapore created five projects program in which we allow the vessel to be in our encourage, uh, encourage and then test out the smart system, the autonomous capabilities with supervision to make sure that innovation can happen while at the same time preserving the safety for the other port users uh, in the Singapore waters. So I think it's very important. Uh, of course, there are some other innovation uh, that need not uh, really make use of regulatory sandbox. It's really happening in the maritime corporate industries. So, you know, I think uh, we have already seen in Singapore, you have the rain making who is here driving decarbonization. We have companies like, uh, you know, uh, EPS who actually have their own accelerator. Uh, EPS is the Eastern Pacific Shipping. You have, of course, NYK having uh, Symphony Creative Solution. They have their own creative and acceleration programs to bring in startup into marine time. And we often are very amazed by the type of solution from other industries coming to Singapore. So I think talent for us, uh, we know and reckon that Singapore is a small community and therefore we really need to leverage on each other uh, uh, capabilities and talent to kind of augment each other. Thank you, Terry. Thanks for that, Kenneth. And yes, you're absolutely right. In our own works at Rainmaking, we see that uh, increasingly startups from outside the industry are looking and starting those discussions about the role of shipping and is there a business model for them to enter uh, the maritime industry but there is still a long uh, road ahead of us to actually accelerate that process right between the various maritime ecosystems around the world let me sort of uh, get maria into the conversation here from a purely regulatory perspective right uh, while we're thinking about decarbonization we're thinking about the new regulations that have come online from imo how is from a regulator perspective do you see digital transformation as a risk perspective, right? How is regulation keeping pace with the innovation that are coming into the industry? Especially with the view where IMO takes probably a decade to reach a political agreement to actually roll out uh, a new regulation. 
Well, spot on, uh, Tarun. That is one of the challenges of the IMO. While IMO is, is the strongest regulator that we have because it's a global regulator, I mean, together with aviation, uh, shipping and aviation are the only two industries in the world that, that has enjoys the, 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 the pleasure of having a global regulator. But I mean, you said before, you know, shipping is heavy regulated. Yes, in many perspectives, uh, perspectives, especially when it comes to, to safety, as Kenneth also alluded to. But in terms of climate seen from the outside world, uh, it's by civil society. Shipping is not very heavily regulated at all. And it seems like the outside world is losing um, its patience. With, with, with the IMO, with the industry itself. And, and that is really a paradox uh, for the IMO as well. And one has to remember that IMO is nothing more than what the member states of IMO make it. It's not the IMO in, as an institution or the IMO as secretariat. It's the 174 member states that hold the key to any progress. And, and, and the problem is when you start discussing and regulating climate, it becomes IMO turns into this um, forum. You can you can you you can you can be in doubt of whether you're sitting at IMO or you're at UNFCCC, you know, the global uh, climate uh, negotiations, because all of a sudden you're not talking shipping anymore. It's not the shipping experts, but it's the whole uh, discussion between developing and developed countries. And then we come back to the CBDR principle where common uh, but differentiated responsibilities, meaning that some of the developing countries should not contribute to the same uh, level as the, as the developed countries. But the problem is, as we all know in shipping, we need to have, you know, we need to treat the flags equally because otherwise we'll just see re, uh, re-flagging. Uh, looking into, uh, to coming back to, to, to your question, I think, the industry itself need to take a very good look in the mirror. I, I don't think I'm going to offend anybody by saying that shipping is a conservative industry, period. I think shipping is, needs to really look into business models as well. I mean, we have, you know, contracts, you know, tracing back to the 19th century in terms of the, when you, with the charter parties, right? we have the, the issue of split incentive and the investments that we are facing right now, that needs to, that needs to be changed as well. We need to change the wording of the, of, the, of the charter parties so that we spread the responsibility, not only to the owner to make the investments, but also to the, to the charters, to the customer, et cetera. That's one thing. But then also the whole pattern of how the shipping industry works there's a lot of inefficiency. For instance, ballast voyages. I mean, that's just an embedded part of how the industry functions, right? But why don't we somehow start to, to eliminate ballast voyages, just, just to give an example. But there's so many embedded things within the industry saying, well, this is the way it always worked, right? And in terms of data, there is a very, very large unleashed potential within this. And you can see this when, when, when people start tapping into to the area of data. It's very, there's very little data surrounding the vessels today. And it could be a lot more, especially when we talk about emissions. Um, and, and we need to improve the data so that we get the regulation right from, from, from the outset. Thank you. Thanks for that, Maria. I mean, uh, while we react to your comments there, I would also encourage all the audience to pop in their questions as we go forward. Uh, going back to your points, Maria, of course, there are quite a few of the historical, I don't want to use the word artifacts, which are still around the maritime industry in the forms of incentive structures or contracts or ways of working, right? And often we have to think about repurposing some of these uh, uh, you know, ways of working as we sort of evolve the industry. One of the things that uh, is really close to my heart is how do we reskill the existing talent pool, right? Because very quickly, you will not have a new set of seafarers, new set of data operators, new set of people who understand the future of shipping and something that is as dangerous as shipping as well, right? So how do you reskill talent moving forward while making sure you're able to attract new set of talent to take care of the deep tech technologies that are coming into the industry while making sure you're also having the crucial capacity of 
I don't want to say, uh, you know, existing talent pool, keeping the wheels of shipping going. So let me call upon Sanjay here, right? How do you think about reskilling talent? How do you attract new kind of talents into the industry? Uh, thanks for that, Tarun. Yeah, I think it's a very important uh, aspect, especially in the decarbonization uh, area. Um, you know, if you look at the, if you go through a man management of change process, when you transition from one form of fuel to another form of fuel, and you think through the management of change, you will realize that you will need new skills to make sure that the management of change happens safely. And therefore, in the reskilling, new knowledge has to be created so that the current workers are able to not only facilitate the transition safely, but also maximize the use of existing assets uh, as, as it plugs into new assets. So you, you, know, you don't rip out the entire vessel or, uh, and then you try and put in the new stuff in. You, you need people who understand the old so that you can transition into the new. So you have that group that will have help the management of skill, uh, management of change, and this, the skill upgrading will have to come through knowledge, and the knowledge will have to be shared so that people will be able to do that transition. And I think, like you pointed out, there's a group of skill in terms of the innovator creator, but there's a group of skills in terms of to the adopter. Uh, uh, and then you've got the group that has to maintain the system, you know, uh, and these different skill sets needs to be managed well. We can't assume that they can be totally replaced because you are working with a hybrid of assets. You know, you're not, unless you're building a completely new vessel, then you need to train the new group of people to manage a new vessel. So I think this, this whole, this gap is going to have to be based on knowledge and knowledge creation. And this is where uh, either through researchers or people in the know-how or even the leadership at government level that we need to actually establish this base knowledge. If not, you cannot make the transition. And, you, and the worst thing is you make the transition in an unsafe manner that then uh, rem, uh, diminishes the confidence level of these new innovation and technologies. Good. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sanjay. Uh, very quickly going to Bo and posing the same question. How do you see the challenge of reskilling existing uh, talent? I think uh, this is going to be one of the big, uh, big challenges. Uh, on the other hand, I, I believe that uh, the shipping industry has a way of managing <clears throat> the necessary competences on board. So uh, I, I, I see that as a challenge, yes, but not, uh, not as a showstopper or, or a barrier at all. But it's definitely something that needs to be taken uh, very seriously in this uh, transition. And as it was mentioned here, safety uh, is of essence uh, for shipping as it is in other industries. And shipping has managed actually to mature and achieve uh, very high levels of safety. And uh, one of the things that we, we mustn't, uh, or, or that we must do in this transition is maintain that level of safety. So we are certainly very concerned and very occupied from, from our side to make sure that we don't take any uh, wild bets on safety. So, you know, when we bring uh, new technologies and new energy forms in play, it needs to be very well managed. And that is about uh, the technology maturity. It's about the reliability and the technical safety systems. And it is certainly about the human element uh, in all of that. And so we are gonna now be facing uh, a decade where the industry needs to test out new ways of, of driving ships, new ways of using technologies and energies on board the ships. And we are going to keep a very, very strong discipline around never ever taking a wild bets on, uh, on safety. And um, I think it's, uh, it's one of the things that is so ingrained in the industry and, and everything is marinated in this uh, safety aspect. So I'm not really concerned about it or worried about it, but it is 
uh, for sure going to be important. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I think uh, it's, it's good in a forum like this to bring it up and to remind ourselves that we need to give room for the very innovative ideas. We need to bring in R&D and small companies and large companies to develop the new solutions. And we need to never, ever forget that safety remains the top priority in this. So it's, uh, it's really a fascinating one, you know, because uh, there's going to be some we are going to be facing some really interesting discussions and, and, and balances that need to be found and borderlines that need to be made clear in as to, to how we actually drive this transition. And, you know, as speed is of essence here, urgency is high, then we're going to be faced with dilemmas along the way. And I think we need to remain open about that and really uh, work in a very transparent and open manner so that, uh, you know, we're not, you know, doing big, uh, big things, jeopardizing uh, safety sort of in, in, in closed rooms. So, yes, very important topic. Thank you for that, Bo. Definitely uh, music to my ears, that collaboration and open... Uh... Uh, uh, openness between uh, efforts is required, but not at the cost of safety, right? Big industry has reached at this level of safety after a lot of hard work. So let's not forget uh, the hard work that's done in the past. Uh, we've got some very interesting questions from the audience, uh, specifically from Ari and Kenneth. Uh, as we've been discussing, this next decade can be transformative for the maritime industry when we think about climate action and decarbonization. But are the regulations enough? Are we doing enough? Is the IMO regulation around EXI or CII, is it really enough in the current shape or form? Why are we stopping at uh, the current levels? Why not completely zero, right? So let me start with Maria there. Well, excellent question. And, and uh, the, the very short answer is no, the EEXI is not enough. Um, that's also why we, we fought very hard to have, I mean, the EEXI would be the technical part of the efficiency uh, regulation. We fought very hard to have operational uh, efficiency, efficiency as part of, of the equation to, to meet the, uh, the, the uh, 2030 40% reduction target. The problem is that in any case, efficiency targets will never take us to anywhere near we want to go with the absolute target of 50% reduction in 2050. That's why we need at the same time where we're working in parallel. I mean, right now we're working on, on the very technical guidelines, which will be accompanying the, the, the short term measures um, adopted last year and will come into force uh, very soon. <clears throat> But we need to make sure that the short term measures will not be a stumbling block for the absolute reductions going forward. That's why it's to us, Danish shipping, it is imperative that we get the measurements right from the outset. Right now, IMO applies a proxy for efficiency or transport work. That, that is the AER. We would like to, 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 to base ourselves on the EEUI so that we actually have the actual cargo transport, uh, the cargo uh, transported within the equation. And why is that? That's because otherwise you cannot measure the efficiency accurately. And efficiency will remain an important factor because as Bo said earlier, the new fuel types will become a lot more expensive. So efficiency will, will continue to, to matter. In terms of the target for 2050, is, is a 50% reduction enough? No. Uh, at Danish Shipping, we've set the target as, you know, we, we're, we're working towards zero carbon uh, uh, shipping. But can we get the rest of the world on board? We don't, that, that will, we, we have to, to, that will remain to yet to be seen. But in any case, the targets will be revised in 23. That's part of the IMO um, greenhouse gas uh, reduction uh, strategy. And in our view, this needs to be based on science, well, science-based targets. So that looking at the Paris Agreement, where I think we're beyond the two degree target, we're looking towards 1.5, but what does it actually mean vis-a-vis -vis a carbon budget? And what does it mean vis-a-vis -vis in comparison with, with the rest of the world? Shipping as, as one single industry should not you know, reduce faster than the rest of the world. It, it should be at the same pace. 
but we should definitely contribute with our parts. So that's why I'm also very, very happy to say that I just saw yesterday that Singapore has uh, has put its name uh, as co-sponsor on the proposal from the, the industry, the International uh, international Shipping Organization to, uh, to set up an um, international maritime research uh, board funded by the industry so that every time the industry uh, buys a ton of fuel, there will be a contribution into this fund. This is the way forward. And then we need to start uh, discussing a real market-based measure at the same pace. And that, again, refers back to the whole discussion between developed and developing countries. So we need time to discuss this because we need everybody on board. Thank you. Thanks for that, Maria. Let me just ask Kenneth the same question from a Singapore context, right? Are we doing enough uh, as the shipping industry? And how can we accelerate, if at all? Well, I think the obvious question is that we could do more. And uh, to accelerate that, I think what uh, we believe will be really an ecosystem approach. Because I think, as uh, you know, Maria and even Dr. Bo mentioned, um, the question we have been thinking about is that there are many shipping lines, many tech players, many innovators trying different things. So where is that? common place in which we can then have sharing of this information, learning about the pitfalls, the safety uh, precaution that we need to put in place at standards and practices. I, I think that's an important element that we have been uh, advocating. And we, we think that a practical way is to have a joint industry project in which you can then go into a specific uh, area in uh, decarbonization, go deep into it, demonstrate that what you are trying, whether it is fuel, whether it's for efficiency, whether it is for safety, uh, whether it is bunkering practices, how do operation do that? I think all this needs to be uh, learned as we go, make that into something that is shareable that people can then see how this is being done uh, or needs to be mitigated by other measures. Uh, and then we then connect up to the different port authorities, uh, you know, so that's why we had this uh, future fuel network in which we then get the different port authority to say, well, if we were to do these are the things that we foresee are potential uh, risk or, or mitigation or uh, some of the rewards that we see when consortium come together and practice. So I think the, the acceleration part is really trying to come together. So we ourselves, for instance, join, uh, you know, have some, uh, we join some uh, joint uh, industry project to really get our hands uh, into, say, the bunkering standards, uh, say, for ammonia, and then see how we can then from there learn and uh, set up the practices for our bunkering. Thanks for that, Ken. I definitely agree that an ecosystem approach and we as Rainmaking firmly believe in a similar approach and work very closely with uh, you on that is a potential uh, way forward, regulation or no regulation. There's a question around how do we use emissions data, right? Essentially, the flavor is tech-enabled provenance. So my question here is, as the industry is adopting technology, right, uh, from a decarbonization perspective, how do you see transparency and the impact of technology on transparency? Uh, both from a commercial transparency to an operational transparency, right? How crucial it is because it's got a direct impact on how business has been done in the shipping industry all throughout uh, the last few decades. So maybe if I could start with Bo there. This is going to be a key enabler for this transition. We are going to have to take advantage of new infrastructure, new sensor technologies, uh, and uh, new opportunities for uh, analyzing and visualizing uh, data. It's, uh, this is one of the areas where we are going to need to see a complete transformation of not only the shipping industry, but also uh, the supply chain delivering uh, the fuels uh, to the ships. So, you know, this is a huge, huge uh, thing. Customers are going to demand transparency and data. Regulators are going to demand transparency and data. Ship-owning companies are going to need to do it to optimize their operations and remain competitive. We are going to see a transformation. It's going to be needed. So I think that's the short answer. And there are so many layers 
uh, to this, you know, that uh, I don't think we have time to go much more into detail, but it's going to be big. Yep. Thanks for that. Uh, very conscious of time here, but, but I definitely want to get Sanjay's perspective on tech-enabled transparency, right? So 30 seconds, Sanjay, what do you think uh, of role of technology for transparency? Yeah, uh, definitely important. And I think the IMO has tried that with the fourth GHG study. We, we need to normalize one methodology or accepted methodology because when you when you start using data to either incentivize or punish uh, uh, organizations in the maritime sector, then people will have will start to argue, is your methodology correct? So until we have a common basis of evaluating the performance of technology, in a formula, uh, it is going to be a very debatable move forward, right? So we got to get those baselines sorted out and then we can move forward on incentives or punishments. Thanks for that, Sanjay. Uh, before we wrap up, I'm going to ask all of you to give me last 20 seconds. What is it that we can do in the next 18 to 24 months that we accelerate our journey towards a decarbonized shipping? So let me start with Maria. Thank you. I, I will share a little, a little story that one of my uh, CEO from a member company told me that, you know, looking at the staff uh, members, he was standing together with two other colleagues having the same background in shipping. And then they said, well, you know, we have 75% of the knowledge that we need in this room. What about the last 25%? The, it's the last 25% that we all need to focus on and we need to look outside our industry in order to attract the talent. And it needs to be done now. So the last 25%. Those are the important ones for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Kenneth. Thank you. Um, I would say that actually it will be by 2050, actually it will be our children who will be looking back and say whether we have done a good job, all of us together uh, in this panel, in this audience, in this virtual webinar. Uh, I think so that is an important uh, lesson that now as we go forward working on many of these aspects, think about what will they talk about us. Um, but for the next 18 to 24 months, I think that will be uh, very interesting and very uh, important. Uh, we have already set uh, going on our uh, international advisory panel. So by April, a set of recommendations will come out for us to execute. Uh, we will see uh, many joint uh, industry projects that will happen. Uh, and I think that will be lesson that we can learn. Uh, there will be R&B, uh, master plan, roadmap that we should come out with. So I think that will also be something that we like to uh, seek the advice from many. Uh, as well as uh, I think in 24 months, you will again see two innovation cycle that will already happen. Uh, because every year we do that cycle, uh, you know, to gather all the maritime companies to come up with challenge statements. So you also see two uh, innovation cycles. So I think in the next 18 to 24 months, you will see plenty of things happening. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, maybe quick one from Sanjay and then Bo and then off to Judy. Sanjay. Okay. Adopt a purposeful, collaborative creation, um, uh, impactful for, uh, you know, to decarbonize the shipping industry. That's a big ambition. Thanks, Sanjay. Dr. Bo. Collaboration to develop solutions. So our approach, and we would like to open this up to Singapore and the rest of the world, come join us and develop concrete solutions. We have a number of very concrete things that we're going to, you heard about the Maersk project, that's only one of many concrete projects that we are putting steel in the water and steel in the ground to move the needle. And that requires to really leverage that, to really get the most out of that, requires collaboration across the globe because there's so many learnings that can be leveraged. So this is just an invitation to join, to join the solution. Uh, I would say more than a think tank, the solution and the do tank. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for that. I think uh, definitely uh, we will take up on that invitation for collaboration. Uh, I really enjoyed the panel. Uh, with that, uh, on my behalf, thank you so much to all the panelists and over to you, Jodi. Thank you, Tarun, for the amazing moderation of today's panel discussion on maritime innovation, where we discuss connecting tech and talent for decarbonization. On behalf of SG Innovate, I would like to also give special mention to Dr. Bo, Kenneth, Maria, and Dr. Sanjay for joining us for today's session, and also to thank uh, our CEO, Dri, and Ambassador Landi for opening our session. 
We would also like to give thanks again to our part, our event partner and close friend, the Royal, the Royal Danish Embassy in Singapore for making today's event possible. We also like to thank our attendees for tuning in and staying till the end of the session. And while we were not able to answer all of the questions submitted due to certain time constraints, we hope that we still manage to cover valuable insights on the topic. Please keep a lookout for our post-event EDM, which will include a recording of this session posted on our YouTube page. And we will also appreciate if you did give us your feedback on the session after ending this webinar. We also hope that you could join us at our other community events at SG Novate. And uh, for everyone to also have a great morning, afternoon, or evening ahead from wherever you're tuning from. Thank you so much and see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice Take weekend. Okay, everyone.